I'm Larry Temple as chairman of the LBJ Foundation. It is a very distinct privilege for me to welcome all of you and introduce this program tonight. Uh, before I introduce the uh, people that will be on stage tonight, let me acknowledge that we have here in the audience uh, Robert K. Rose's partner, partner in a real sense, uh, his wife, but also his research partner. All of the research on all of Bob's work have, are done by Bob and his wife, Ina. Uh, and Ina is here with us tonight. And Ina, you're very welcome and glad you're here again. I'm going to do this in reverse order. Uh, tonight, uh, Robert K. Rowe will engage in a conversation with Stephen Harrigan. Uh, Steve is uh, no stranger to this institution. He's one of us and one of the most prominent uh, writers that we have in this state. He's one of the very, very best, probably best known for his award-winning Looming Towers, but he's written so many wonderful books. What? The Alamo. Okay, okay. You know, you, you're stuck with me. The people coming on stage are a whole lot smarter. Uh, but anyway, uh, Steve Harrigan will uh, lead the conversation uh, with Bob Cairo. Now, how do you introduce Bob Cairo? Obviously, everybody in this audience knows who he is, and that's the reason you're here. Uh, so what can I tell you in introducing him that uh, might be a little new and a little different uh, for you? Uh, you obviously know that he is the most prominent biographer of LBJ. That's the reason you're here. You probably also know that his first writing was the power broker that he wrote about Robert Moses, the man who really built New York and he won a Pulitzer Prize and a National Book Award for that publication. And then he decided in 1976 that he was gonna take on what he called the years of Lyndon Johnson. It was to be a three book work. He's now finished his fourth book, uh, working on the fifth book in that three uh, book work. Uh, and uh, he also has won a Pulitzer Prize uh, and a National Book Award, and many, many other recognitions and awards for all of his work during all that time. Now, that tells you something about uh, Bob Cairo and uh, maybe what he's done, but it doesn't really explain Bob Cairo to you or to me. And I think to really understand Bob Cairo, you've got to go back to the beginning. He originally uh, was a reporter. He's a journalist at heart. Uh, his first writing was uh, as a journalist for Newsday, uh, and he was a, a, an investigative reporter for Newsday. And he learned his craft of investigation and research and writing by being an investigative reporter. And he was very successful in doing that. And Bob says that the best counsel, the best advice that he ever got uh, was when his editor said, turn every page, look under every rock. And Bob has followed that uh, throughout his career. And even today, Bob still has all of the traits and attributes of a journalist. Uh, when he does an interview, he doesn't have a recorder. He has a journalist pad and he writes down and takes notes. And that's the way he goes about his craft of his research. Now, Bob has spent, uh, and Ina, has spent many, many hours in this library and have been through probably more papers, more archives than anybody that's ever come into this library. Uh, but they also have a unique and different way of doing their research. And again, it's the work of an investigative reporter. One example, I'm gonna give you two examples. One example was that in the early time of doing the research, Bob read that as a congressional aide, uh, LBJ used to run every morning from where he lived to his office at the Capitol, same route, almost the same time every day. Bob said he didn't understand that. 
Why, why was he running? Was he trying to get to work in a hurry? What, what was he seeing? What was he thinking? So Bob said that the way he wanted to try to learn a little something about that small piece of LBJ was that he went that same route at the same time of the morning as LBJ did just to see what LBJ was seeing as he went along that route. Well, now, I think he probably didn't run like LBJ was reputed to have done. I think Bob may have walked. But nonetheless, uh, he went that same route. And then again, when he first got started in doing the research and writing on LBJ, he said he couldn't really get a feel for the hill country, couldn't really understand the people of the hill country. So he said to Ina, I think we need to move to the hill country, move from New York to the hill country and live there and see if we can get a feel for the people, a feel for uh, the uh, territory. And Ina, by the way, quipped and said, uh, well, I'm going to go, but why couldn't you have written a biography of Napoleon? <laughs> uh, I told you she was smart. Uh, but anyway, they moved to the hill country, actually lived there three years uh, to get to know the people, to get to know the area. And it was just their way of uh, doing, as an investigative reporter would have done, to learn about the area and learn about the people. Now, Bob uh, has said publicly he still plans to go spend a considerable amount of time in Vietnam. He said he wants to go over there and see what it feels like, uh, what the people were feeling like, fighting in the jungles of Vietnam. So you can see we have a man that's not only a very, very prominent, very highly esteemed uh, biographer, but a man who still continues to be a journalist. And we're all richly blessed because he brings the results of that journalism and that uh, biography to us in all of the writings and all that he does. Now, tonight, uh, he's probably going to talk about uh, his new book that I hope some of you out bought out there called Working. Uh, Bob has said openly and publicly it's not intended to be a memoir. Uh, rather, it's to uh, recite some of his experiences, some of the things he's learned, some of the things he's done in his writing craft and research craft over the years. So I think we're in for a treat with two really outstanding writers of our time. So welcome to the stage, uh, Steve Harrigan and Robert Caro. That was the nicest introduction. Hello, everyone. Bob, welcome back to the LBJ Library. Glad where to be here. Larry mentioned you've been here before. <laughs> and uh, you, in your new book, Working, you mentioned that you've spent not just weeks here, months here, but literally years here yes. in, in, the, in the archives, which yes. is pretty remarkable. Uh, by the way, we're going to have time in, uh, at the last part of this for about 10 minutes of audience questions. You and I both know the first question that's going to be asked, which is, when are you going to be finished with your LBJ <laughs> biography? So can we pretend I asked that question and you refused to answer it and, and, and move on to talk about, about your new book? Uh, this is as magisterial as, as your Robert Moses biography and, your, and your, your Johnson biography have become or have always been. This book is really special. It's a wonderful book. It's, it's, I'd say it's part memoir, part credo, <laughs> uh, part, uh, part how-to manual for people who, who want to be writers and want to be reporters. And one of the things that, one of the, the cru cru crucial things I, that I took away from it was a phrase that you use, which is time equals truth. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that and how, how you never give up in terms of, of, of looking for the next detail or the next anecdote or, or insight when you're working on a book? Well, you're compliment, you put that in a complimentary way, <laughs> sort, sort of nuts. As <laughs> but when I was a reporter, uh, Larry referred to this, I had never done investigative work. And because I was the lowest man on the totem pole, 
the day of my newspaper's picnic, everybody else was on a picnic and on the beach at Fire Island. So there was an era before cell phones so no one could get in touch. And someone called me from this federal agency that Newsday had been looking into, not me, but the real reporters. <laughs> and finally my editor said, well, you'll have to go yourself. So I found out I really loved going through files. I went down there, he, this man met me at the door. He led me to a room where all the files were that he said that I'd find what I needed. And I wrote a long memo to my managing editor. So I had an editor then who was out of the 1920s, the front page days. His name was Alan Hathaway. And we were never sure if Alan had actually attended a college, but he hadn't graduated from one. And he really didn't, he had never, he didn't like people from prestigious universities. I was the first, literally, it's hard to believe, the first reporter from an Ivy League school that had ever been hired into his city room. And he wouldn't talk to me. So the, I've been there for like three or four months and he'd walk by my desk and I'd say, hello, Alan, or good morning, Mr. Hathaway, but he'd never respond. No. So I wrote this memo on what I found in the files and I left it and I went, we went, I went home. The next morning, his secretary called and said, Alan wants to see you right away. And I said to Ina, see, I was right not to move. I'm about to be fired. <laughs> so I drove in there and I, he had a big head. He only had a fringe of hair around the back of his head. And his head was very red because he drank a lot. <laughs> And I'm walking across and I see this big head bent over something and as I get close to his office, which is glass enclosed, I saw that he's reading my memo. And I'm standing there and he sort of waves me to the chair and I'm sitting there and he looks up and he says, I didn't know someone from Princeton could go through files like this. From now on you do investigative work. Well, with my usual savoir faire at moments like this, I said, <laughs> but I don't know anything about investigative work. <laughs> so he looked up at me and he said, just remember one thing, turn every page. Never assume every, anything, turn every goddamn page. And you know, for the, all the t time that I'm down here in the Johnson Library, of course you can't turn every page or even any real percentage of them because they're, I think they said there are 45 million pieces yeah, of paper about, here. But you can zero in mm -hmm. on a period in Johnson's life and say I'm going, and over and over again when I've done that, you sit there turning these pages, you think they're, I'm just wasting my life, and then suddenly there is the letter or the telegram you've been looking for. Right. Well, you and I met, I think, in 1990 when I wrote a, a, a profile of you for Texas Monthly. <laughs> and at that time, I, I interviewed your your equally legendary editor, Robert Gottlieb, Bob oh. Gottlieb, <laughs> who said this about you. What's most remarkable, remarkable about Bob Carroll is the depth, the obsessiveness, the accuracy of his research, the totalness of it. He simply never stops. <laughs> and uh, that's a pretty remarkable uh, quality in, in, in a profession where particularly like journalism, where there's deadlines. Yes. And, but you seem to have managed to escape the idea of a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> and how, where does that self-confidence come from? Oh, I have to say, whatever it is, it's not self-confidence. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, but you know, I always, when I was a reporter, you have deadlines. Mm -hmm. I always hated having to write a story when there was, I still had a question that uh -huh. I wanted to get answered. And when I started out to write books, I remember when I said, the first book on Robert Moses, I said, you know, I'm not gonna start writing until I've answered every question that, that I had. Uh -huh. And um, people ask why my books take so long, but they do take a long time. But I always feel, uneasy, it's not self-confidence, mm. if I feel there's still stuff that relates to what I'm writing that I haven't looked at mm. yet. But you're, you say in your book that you're a very fast writer. 
paradoxically, I guess. Well, <laughs> as far as writing, I'm, real, uh -huh. I'm really, I am, when I, was, I, I'm, when I was on the newspaper, I was the fastest rewrite man, you know, so. It's <laughs> impressive. You, you, sw you, you know, as you mentioned, of course, and as we know, you, you moved from daily journalism to decades-long <laughs> books. And the first book you wrote was The Power Broker about Robert Moses, and you thought it would take you nine months, I think? Nine months, yes. And uh, it took you five years, which is, for those of us who write books, that sounds about right. Uh, but uh, you got, a, I think, a $5,000 advance, Yes. And you got half of that up front. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, and you, you say in the book that you hate being broke. So describe those years for us when you were in fact broke and writing under this you know, hum humongous deadline of trying to produce this massive tome about Robert Moses. Well, so I got the, what you say. Twenty five hundred. I was a reporter, so Einer and I basically we didn't have any savings. Uh -huh. But I got a grant uh, from the uh, foundation grant, and that they, that was for a year. Uh -huh. And I remember I said to Einer, "We'll finally get to go to France uh -huh. because they're paying me for a whole year. I'm going to be dying in nine months." <laughs> 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 so of course, after the year, we were broke. I, and, and I didn't know what to do, and I came home one day, and Ina said, we sold the house today. <laughs> and I didn't really care that much about the house, but Ina really loved it. Uh -huh. But we sold it. Unfortunately, it was the days before the real estate boom. Right. So I remember we bought it for $45,000, and we sold it for $70,000, so we cleared $25,000. That got us through a second year. Uh -huh. Then I was really... I remember the years after that oh. as being broke. And at some point, I had an editor who would never return my, te he wouldn't return my telephone calls mm -hmm. for a long time. And I gave him about half the manuscript, which is about a half a million words. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, I didn't hear from him for a long time. And finally, he takes me to dinner at a very inexpensive Chinese restaurant on Broadway. <laughs> I, I, would realize now what that meant. And he said, <laughs> you know, we, we like the, this was not Bob Godley, it was another editor uh -huh. at another publishing house. And uh, he said, um, we like the book, basically, we like the book, keep going. I said, can I have my other $2,500? <laughs> and he said, and they're words that I never forgot because they were so, they've been better in my memory. He said, oh no, Bob, I guess you didn't understand. We like your book, but nobody's going to read a book on Robert Moses. And you have to be prepared for a very small printing. And we're not prepared to go beyond the terms of the contract, which even I figured out meant I wasn't going to get the $2,500. <laughs> that, you know, was the worst. Maybe we all have bad moments. That was the worst moment that I can remember in my professional life anyway. I didn't know how to tell Ina this. I remember I walked all the way, and this was the, this was the 1970s, you know, uh -huh. and this, the late 60s, and Harlem was a dangerous place. Uh -huh. But I didn't even think about that. I walked home because I didn't know how to tell Ina this. Luckily, not long after, just a couple of weeks after that, this editor left. Now, I had signed my contract. I didn't have an agent, but I knew I needed an agent. So I went, finally, I, I interviewed a number of agents. I remember I, there were four, three men and a woman. This was before the women's movement had come. So I, in, I went to see the three men first. <laughs> finally, I went to see an, uh, Lynn Nesbitt, an agent, and she said to me, Basically, I like your manuscript. I'd like to represent you. But you have to tell me, what are you so worried about? <laughs> and of course, my editor had made me feel no one was going to read, no one was interested in this book. I said, well, I'm worried that I won't have enough money to finish the book. And she said, well, how much are you talking about? I don't remember what the figure was, but it was enough for, to live on for two years. It wasn't that large. Mm -hmm. And I, these were also sentences that I've never forgotten. 
she said, is that what you're worried about? You can stop worrying right now. Everybody in New York knows about this book, and I can get that for you by just picking up the phone. Mm -hmm. What I have to do is find you an editor you can work with for the rest of your life. So she found me Bob Cotley. Uh -huh. So they have been, the, the year was 19, this year was 1971, and Lynn has been my agent and Bob Gottlieb have been my editor since 1971. It's a long <laughs> run, wow. <laughs> <laughs> when you finally turned that book into Gottlieb, you ended up, this, this, I really, I, this is hard to imagine. I just wrote a, a, a book that was 325,000 words. I don't, people, I don't think people understand how many book pages that is. That's 900 pages. Yes. You cut that much out of the power broker. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, what was that like? And that was, that was bad. <laughs> that was, there was blood on the floor. Huh? <laughs> yes, but so I handed in to him a, a million fifty thousand words. And we had to cut it, not because he himself has said, I, I, uh, he uses the pronoun I a lot. I'm not sure he has the pronoun we in his vocabulary. <laughs> he says, I cut 350,000 of the best words I ever wrote. But that was the maximum amount, the number of pages in the Power Broker, Steve, which I think is 1,368, is the maximum number of pages you can bind between wow. uh, covers <laughs> and have a trade, yes. trade book. <laughs> Another thing you talk about in the book that's so interesting to me is there's this, there's this kind of thread of loneliness that runs through this book in a weird way. When you're, particularly in that part of your life, when you're, you're making that transition from, uh, from, a, from a, a daily journalist to a book writer. And one of the things I, I wrote down uh, was you say, the easy gratifications that go with a journalist's life the bylines, the gratitude or the wary respect or fear that the subjects of your articles had for you, the awareness of friends and neighbors of what you were doing, the feeling that you were at the center of the action, that I was succeeding in doing what I had set out to do. Those are the things that were, were you know, keeping you alive during the time that you were a daily deadline journalist. Yes. You had to give all that up for this solitude that you endured and st are still enduring, I'm assuming, for many years. What was that transition like? Oh, uh, hard. You know, it's uh, it's hard to be alone all day, uh -huh. and it's hard also because you don't get any feedback. Uh -huh. for, you know, I don't show my manuscripts. I think I, once we're talking about yeah. this, uh -huh. I don't show my manuscript <clears throat> to my to Bob Gottlieb or anybody uh -huh. until I finish the book. Right. So uh, you don't get a feedback, and you keep wondering how, how it is. Uh, yeah. But you learn to live with that. So you don't even show it to Ina? Uh, to tell you the truth, I, I don't. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but she, I, Ina, we should talk a little bit about Ina and uh, you know, the, the, the partnership you guys have had all these yeah. years, not just a marriage, but a, but a, you know, a, a, a you know, literary comradeship, yes. I guess. Because yes. she, she does a lot of the research, a lot of the stuff that needs to be done while you're working on these books. Yes. And she spent as much time here as, I would guess, close to as, as much as you have. And she's moved to the Hill Country with you and yes. lived here. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, Ina, you know, but she's also written two wonderful books right. of her own. Yeah. Ina is a historian, mm -hmm. medieval historian, and mm -hmm. the way we work it out is when we, I finish a section of the book, which can be many chapters or a few chapters, we go to France. <laughs> and for, we, you know, we, we drive around, and um, Ina produces books out of that. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, but she's, you know, she's the only person. You look sometimes in the acknowledgments of some books, and you say, they mentioned they have three or four researchers, mm -hmm. but Ina is the only person I've ever been able to trust to do research on my books beside me. She is the whole team of research. Uh -huh. yeah. So you can kind of read each other's mind about it. She knows what you're looking for. And I, I'm a, I don't know that I could read her mind, <laughs> but I'm afraid she can read my mind. <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> I, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about, uh, which, which you talk about in the book as well, about how you, do, how, how you write, how you interview, all the kind of you know, tools of the trade. I had the opportunity when I, when I met you in New York that time I was writing about you to see your office, which is uh, really interesting in, a, in an uninteresting kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> because it's in a, it's a, it's a, a, a building off Columbus Circle, is that Well, I've, I've had to move you now moved. just a couple of months ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I hope you haven't changed much. No, I have changed decor, nothing. Because as I recall, there was pretty much no decor yeah. in your office. Yeah. <laughs> you had a, a, a frighteningly clean desk. You, you get up every morning and you put on a suit and tie and yes. go to work, whereas yeah. everybody else is riding in their pajamas. Yeah. And uh, so there's a, there seems to be a, a, a ritual that you follow, that you feel the need to follow oh. to be productive. Could you tell us about that? Oh, that's, well, that's a very good question. No one ever asked me that. Mm. The reason I wear a, a suit and tie is so I have an editor and a publisher who are really unusual, and they never ask me uh, when is the. I've never been asked when are you going to deliver? When is the book going to be done? Really? So, no, never. All these people want to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so you're sort of in that way in a vacuum, mm -hmm. and months follow months, and they turn into years. So it's so easy to fool yourself that you're really working hard when you're not. So I do everything I can to remind me that it's a job and I have to produce. Uh -huh. So when I was young, everybody wore jackets and ties. Uh -huh. So I wear it to remind myself I'm going to a job and at the end of the day, you know, I write, always write down how many words I wrote that, mm -hmm. wrote that day to, so that I can see that I'm actually producing. And you also have a, a kind of, you have a wall that's, that's covered with this sort of ever-growing outline, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Can you tell people how that works, how you, how you visualize this, this massive books? Well, I'm, I, I'm, not, it's, I'm not sure it's easy to talk about. Mm -hmm. I have to, I don't start writing until I finished all the research. Mm -hmm. And then I have to figure out what the book is about. The, hard, the hardest thing I do is I want to boil what the book's down in my mind to, I always try to say one paragraph, but it's never one, but it's always two or three paragraphs. Because, and if you saw me during this period, I, you'd see a really unhappy guy. I used to come home at the end of the days and have, I, I love a, a Kentucky sour mash called Wella 107. I used to <laughs> sip that while I was unwinding. Mm -hmm. Then I have to, for now I have to stop drinking. Ina keeps saying, boy, I wish you could still <laughs> <laughs> drink at the end of the day. But if I can make my, so sometimes it takes a couple of weeks or more than a couple of weeks before I can say, this is what the book is really about mm -hmm. in two or three paragraphs. But I found if I can do that, and I can type it out, these couple of paragraphs, and as you say, thumbtack it on the wall next mm -hmm. to my desk. When I go off on these digressions, you know, what was the hill country like before Lyndon Johnson bought electricity, or the biography of Richard Russell, or that sort of thing, mm -hmm. I can always look over at that, those couple and say, is what I'm writing here relate to that mm -hmm. and bring it back to that main theme? I learned that the, the very, oh, I, don't, I learned that really the very hard way because when I was doing The Power Broker, I'd never done a book. So I didn't know what I was just telling you right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I finished the research and I couldn't start writing. You know, I just, it was such a mass of stuff, I couldn't outline it. Mm -hmm. I, but what I was doing then, Robert Moses had long since had long since stopped speaking to me. But <laughs> I would go whenever he was making a public appearance and I would be in the audience. Mm -hmm. So one day he was speaking out, he was dedicating uh, something out of Flushing Meadow at the World's Fairs, because he built the two World's Fairs, among other things, of course. And the idea of his speech is, why weren't people more grateful to him? I mean, he, he, he couched it this way. He said, someday 
we're going to sit here and reflect on the question of the ingratitude of the public <laughs> toward great men. This is the way, the way he put it. So I'm standing there, and he's saying this, you know, like, why, why, why aren't they grateful? And I suddenly, it just hit me. I said, oh, that's what the book's about. Here's a man who did so much. He built all the bridges, all the roads, all the parks, so much public housing. Why isn't New York grateful to him? The minute that hit me, I said, oh, I, could, I went back to the office and I started outlining, and the whole book just fell into place. So I learned if I can just get it down to a succinct, a little summary of a sentence or two or a couple of paragraphs, then it becomes easier for me. So it's kind of a big bang model. You start with a small thing and it expands from there. Maybe. <laughs> well, have, have you found, uh, I'm not asking you to reveal it, but have you found that paragraph or two for volume five? I think I have, yeah. Good, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out when I finish. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, there was, uh, Getting back to, to how you write, you don't use a tape recorder when you're interviewing people. You, you work on legal pads, but not yellow legal pads, white, white legal white pads. White legal pads, yeah. For any particular reason that we need to know? No, I use white legal, the trouble is they stop, I use white legal pads, when, you know, for any particular reason. The reason, I'll tell you why I, I, I write in longhand the first few drafts is because I had a professor at Princeton, a creative writing professor, mm. very, at the time, an old, a very courtly southern gentleman named R.P. Blackmer. He was quite famous at the time, he's forgotten now. And I was in his creative writing course. And I see I'm answering your questions, they're all long. You see why my books are so, are so long. <laughs> So I was taking his course for two years, and every two weeks you had to hand in a, new, a short story. And I always got a good mark on it. And I, but I was always doing these things at the last minute. I was always starting the night before, you know, working all night. And I thought I was fooling him about the amount of thought I was putting into the, mm -hmm. into the writing. At our last session together, he hands me back my short, short story, and he says something complimentary. And I get up to go, and he says, but you know, Mr. Caro, you're never going to achieve what you want to achieve unless you stop thinking with your fingers. And you know, I say in, in the book, did you ever realize that someone has seen right through you? He knew I wasn't putting any work into these stories. So when I, when I was a newspaper man, I could also write very fast. But when I stopped to do the power broker, and I realized how complex it was going to be. Mm -hmm. I said, I have to do something to slow myself down. Mm -hmm. And writing in longhand is really the slowest way of committing your thoughts to paper. So that's why I do it that way. And then you, after you've done a couple longhand drafts, you do a typewritten draft on your yes. Smith Corona? Well, it... Or many, many <laughs> typewritten <laughs> drafts, uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> and it, meanwhile, the, the outline on your wall keeps expanding. There's more detail and stuff, right? Am I uh, understanding I, this? No, the, the outline sort of, I, I do the outline it. before I start writing, okay. yeah. Now, in the book you talk about the, your power, I, I'm calling it your power of concentration. You may call it something else. But you almost slugged a guy once who wanted you to go to lunch with him. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, that's not a compliment to me because the guy I almost slugged was an elderly <laughs> gentleman. It is true that I evidently tend to concentrate very hard. And this guy came up behind me when I was working in the public library and tapped me on the shoulder. And before I knew it, I was up with my fist. I said, yes, very ashamed of that moment. Well, on the other hand, it speaks well for your, for your concentration. So we're not complaining. Or something, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, when you move to the, to the Hill Country, Larry Temple has referred to this in his opening remarks. You, you really dug in. You and I you know, came here and you, you, you spent so much time interviewing people or getting to know people or trying to, to sort of infiltrate yourselves into this culture that was completely alien to you. Yeah. And you know, there are a lot of anecdotes in the book about that. But uh, the one I'd like you to talk about tonight is 
you're, when you, you you're, let, me, let me back up and say, in one point in the book, you talk about how you write in your notebooks, S-U, which means shut up, yes. and how <laughs> silence is the weapon, not to, not to interfere with somebody who's telling a story. And so you're, a, you're not a passive interviewer, but you're, you're a receptive one. You're not saying much. But there are times when you have turned the tables a little bit, and one of those times was with Lyndon Johnson's brother, yeah. Sam Houston Johnson. Could you tell people about that incident where you got him to, to, uh, sure. to really open up? Yeah. Well, this was, you know, a lo- this was a long time ago when I was just starting the work. So, of course, one of the first people I wanted to talk to was Lyndon Johnson's little brother, Sam Houston Johnson. So he was, a, he was a heavy drinker, I had heard that, and he was the kind of a guy who was filled with bravado and braggadocio, mm-hmm. and he would tell these stories, and over and over again, when I checked out the details, they turned out to be so exaggerated or completely untrue. Mm-hmm. So I sort of said, I'm not going to waste any more time on him. I'm not going to speak to him again. So then there was a period of time, and I heard he had this terrible operation for cancer, and I heard he had stopped drinking. And one day I was walking around Johnson City. I used to spend a lot of time just walking around Johnson City, chatting with people, trying to get a feel of the place. And there Sam Houston was coming towards me, and he was like a... he was. He had a cane, he was rather frail. And when we stopped to talk, I I found him very different. So we went to have a cup of coffee and and I found him a different man. So I decided to try interviewing him again. And by this time, I had spent enough time with uh, Lyndon Johnson's family that I knew that whatever the secret was to Johnson's really remarkable personality. It's a, a, this tremendous drive, you know, and the ambition that he had. The key to it had something to do with his relationship with his father, because Lyndon Johnson idolized the father, who was a respected legislator and the most successful businessman in Johnson City and lost everything. He made one mistake and lost everything and the Johnsons lost the ranch. And for the rest of Lyndon Johnson's boyhood, from the time he was 13, they lived in a a little house in Johnson City where he was afraid every month that the house would be taken away from them. Mm -hmm. There was often no food in the house because his mother was often sick, so the neighbors had to bring covered dishes as charity. So I really wanted to get an accurate picture of that. And I thought of a way that I might get Sam Houston to do it. So I got the National Park Service to say we could go into the Johnson boyhood home, which they they had recreated exactly the way it was when Lyndon and Sam Houston were growing up there, after the tourists were gone for the day and it was empty. It was just him and me. And I brought him into the dining room and I asked him to sit down at the same place at the table. At that, that they had a long plank table, and the three sisters sat on one side of the table, and Lyndon and Sam Houston sat on the other, and the father sat at one end in a high back chair, and the mother at the other. And I got him, to, Sam Houston, to sit down in the very same place he had sat at as a boy. And I, I didn't sit at the table. I didn't want him to have anything to distract him. I said. This, I brought him in, it's dinner hour, it's about six o'clock, so even the shadows in the room would be the same shadows as when he was having dinner there. And I sat behind him so he wouldn't see me. And I said, now tell me about these arguments that your father and Lyndon used to have every night at dinner. And at first, I remember it was really slow going. You know, he'd say something and I'd say, well, then what happened? Mm -hmm. But he started talking faster and faster. And finally, he was really into it and he was shouting, you know, you're a failure, Lyndon. You'll always be a failure. Well, what are you? You're a bus inspector, you know? And when he, I said, now, Sam Houston, I want you to, I felt he was really in the mood and, 
remembering accurately. Mm -hmm. So I said, now I'd like you to tell me all these wonderful anecdotes about your brother that you told me before and that other people have told me. Mm -hmm. And it was a long, I remember it as a very important moment. My, he said, it's a long pause. And he said, I can't. And I said, why not? And he said, because they never happened. And then without another word out of me, he sat down and basically told me the story of Lyndon Johnson's youth, a terrible youth, that's in, the, in, in, the, in the, my first volume. Mm -hmm. And this time when I went back to the other people who were involved in each anecdote, they said, yes, that is what happened. And then they gave me more details so I could tell the whole story. That's amazing. <laughs> so you basically orchestrated a seance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and getting back to the kind of more mundane rea realities of interviewing people, you don't use a tape recorder. You're no. using a, just a reporter's notepad, I assume, yeah. or something like that. Uh, is, I find uh, the older I get, the more frantic I get trying to, to write down things and, you know, the yes. people said, are you have, are you just, you have, you use shorthand or how do you? Well, when you, I was a reporter, I created my own shorthand. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have a shorthand, but it's. And so you can like take down conversations and stuff without being too well, nervous about Well, if you want, it. if, if there are paragraphs that someone says to you that you want to get every word, uh -huh. I, I feel I can get every word. Yeah. That's great. No one's ever, t no, in all my interviews, uh -huh. I will say boastfully, no one, with all the, People have criticized my books, but no one's ever said I misquoted them. <laughs> and the other thing you did in, in, in learning about the Hill Country is that you, you got a sleeping bag, and yeah. you went out right. one night and you know, put down a sleeping bag in the middle of nowhere and spent the night and woke up the next morning. That was, must have been odd for a guy from... Well, you know why that was? That also relates to Sam Houston Johnson. When, I, when we moved, the reason, one of the reasons we moved to the Hill Country was it was a place of such loneliness. I mean, now Austin has expanded out there, but then the Hill Country, well, you know this, started right at the Austin Western limit, and it went on for like 300 miles. Right. And the population, very scattered houses. It was a land of great loneliness. I mean, you know, when you were interviewing these people who had grown up with Johnson, the the directions might be something like, you know, you go out of, you drive out of Austin 47 miles and watch for the cattle guard. <laughs> and at the cattle guard, you turn left and you drive, let's say 30 miles mm -hmm. on a unpaved, rutted road. Mm -hmm. When you get to this house, you realize you haven't passed another house in 30 miles. So this was a land of such loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand the loneliness, mm -hmm. you know, so I, it, this was an inadequate way of what you said. I said, I want to see what it's like to spend a day all by yourself, a night all by yourself, and wake up the next day and still have nobody to talk to. And that's why I did that. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked, obviously. Well, it's nice of you to say so. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, Larry had mentioned, there's another really uh, wonderful vignette in this book that Larry Temple mentioned earlier where you, you kind of retraced Lyndon Johnson's steps when he was a young congressional aide, you know, from his, you know, rooming house to the, to the Capitol. And uh, I would, would you mind reading that uh, passage that's from, from, the, from the, I guess this was the first volume, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, it's just so vivid and I wanted to talk about it. I want, could you remind us again you, you decided that there was something missing in your description of Lyndon Johnson's life as a young congressional aide. Yes. And how did you come across the idea that, that you needed to retrace those steps and, and, and oh. follow his, his route every morning? Yeah, you ask good questions. I mean, I mean, one, I mean he had this, you know, even people in Washington's a place of ambition. You yeah. know, a lot of people are very ambitious. But when I started talking to the people like in Franklin Roosevelt's inner circle, mm -hmm. who, when he came up as a 29-year-old congressman in 1937, they said it was something special about his desperation, mm -hmm. about his ambition, mm -hmm. you know? And I felt myself, I wasn't really getting it, you know? 
So I managed to find, he was then what they call the, oh, I'm sorry, I said 1937 as a congressman. This was before. He was a congressman's secretary. We, they called them secretaries. So I found the woman who worked in the office with him. She was from San Antonio. Her name was Estelle Horman. And what would happen was Lyndon Johnson lived in a little hotel down by Union Station. So he'd come up, walk up Capitol Hill, and then when he got in front of the Capitol, he would start running and he'd run the length of the east front of the Capitol, which is 750 feet, and then down to his office on the other side. So Estelle Harmon lived in a boarding house over here behind the Library of Congress. So she'd be coming this way. And I asked her about Lyndon Johnson and she told me what I just said to you, that every morning she'd see him walking up and all of a sudden he'd break into a run. So I said, is there something that's making him excited, that's thrilling him to make him break into a run every morning. Mm -hmm. So over and over again, I walked that same route and I never saw anything in particular. And then I suddenly realized, this is how, this is slow on my part. I had never done it at the time he did it. They were both ranch kids, so they got up with the sun. So he was coming to work and Estelle was coming to work at like six o'clock or even in the 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I never did it at that time. And as soon as I did it, I came and it was just remarkable because at 5.30 or 6, the sun is coming up in the east. So the full force of its level rays hit that 750 what mass of white marble and light it up like some great, huge movie set. So I said, of course, he's coming from this land of little log cabin homes. They call them dog runs. And all of a sudden, everything that, here's the whole majesty of Washington. Yeah. If he can succeed here, he'll have what he wants. Right. And that's what I was trying to show. Well, you did it so well. I printed it out <laughs> and would, would like to ask you to read it if you wouldn't mind. It's only like a few paragraphs. Leaving his room early in the morning, he would turn left down the alley onto a street that ran between the red brick walls of other shabby hotels. <clears throat> but when he turned the corner at the end of the street, suddenly before him, at the top of a long, gentle hill would be not brick, but marble, a great shadowy mass of marble, marble columns and marble arches and marble parapets and a long marble balustrade high against the sky. Veering along a path to the left, he would come up Capitol Hill and around the corner of the Capitol and the marble of the eastern facade, already caught by the early morning sun, would be a gleaming, brilliant, almost dazzling white. A new line of columns stretched ahead of him, a line of columns so long that columns seemed to be marching endlessly before him, the long friezes above them crammed with heroic figures. And columns loomed not only before him, but above him. There were columns atop columns, columns in the sky. That's it. <laughs> I mean, that's such a beautiful and powerful passage. And, uh, you know, uh, I've been studying that for the last couple of days, trying to figure out what makes it work. And it's, it's, the repetition of the word marble, the repetition of the word column. But it's this sort of circular, ever diverging, ever digressing uh, thing that has this power to it that's just this sh sheer narrative power and that, that's headed in one direction <laughs> despite evidence to the contrary sometimes. And I, I'm just wondering, because you talk a lot in the book about how in, how important the craft of writing is when it comes to history and biography and how, how some writers have forgotten uh, rhythm and, and, and other tools of, 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 of that novelists typically use. How, when you write a passage like that, uh, do you, one thing, do you remember writing that passage? Do you remember 
revising it endlessly, or did it? Did it? No, that's what I remember. <laughs> Remember, writing it over and over. Writing it over yeah, and over. Yeah, so yeah. what were the, can you talk a little bit about the decisions you would make in a passage like that? Because I'm assuming you knew it was important. I'm assuming you knew that I've, you know, I've, I've found something here. So what, what went through your mind as you were trying to get it right? Well, one thing that when I, I don't remember ever, every, and a lot of this stuff, but if I do this right, I don't have to give a lecture to the reader on this is why Lyndon Johnson well, had such ambition, because uh -huh. he saw what he could get in Washington, what it could mean to him. Mm -hmm. Because if I can do this right, I'll show the reader what he was seeing, mm -hmm. what made him break into a run, what mm -hmm. excited him. So I said, if I can just show, I don't say that I did this, but this, you asked me what I was trying to do. So I said, if, if I'm succeeding, if I'm in showing his character the way it really was, and showing this scene that excited him mm -hmm. the way he saw it, then I don't have to give the reader a lecture and say, Lyndon Johnson was so ambitious, I can make the reader feel his uh -huh. ambition. That's what I was trying to do. That's a screenwriter's trick. I mean, you know, oh. <laughs> I mean to, to make it visual and make it clear. And you, you've written fiction. You, you wrote like a gigantic short story in the Princeton Review, is that where it was? <laughs> back, back when you were a student. I mean, do you feel, uh, did you feel called to fiction as a writer early on in your career at all? I, well, I wrote a lot of short stories, as you say, at Princeton and all. Uh -huh. but, um, you know, my, you look back on your life, you say, so I got out of Princeton, I became a reporter, uh -huh. so I wasn't writing fiction. And then I got, suddenly felt I had to write this book about political power in New York mm -hmm. and do it through Robert Moses. So you went into that without thinking about fiction. So the answer is mm -hmm. sort of no, you know. But you've, you've retained a, a sense of, of, of power and musicality that's really important to you. And, in prose, I mean, it seems like. Well, you were like, very complimentary. Well, I'm, I'm just saying what's true, <laughs> you know. And it's, it's, but it's so vivid. And and, and, I, and I, again, I, I, those of us who are writers study those paragraphs, trying to figure out how he does it, you know. Which is, which is the great thing about this book. It, it, it the working the, the book we're discussing. It talks not just about why you do it, but how you do it. And and it's a, you know, for anybody who wants to be a writer, I think this is. Crucial reading. I wish I'd read this 40 years ago. <laughs> it's, it's really a, a beautiful book. Uh, we're going to have some time for questions in a few minutes, uh, but I wanted to um, I wanted to ask. The, 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 uh, there were a couple things that that intrigued me early on in the book, where you talk about visiting Robert Moses, yeah. who was at that time. 78 years old, I think, yeah. is that right? Yeah. And you had been on his trail for a long time. You had been, uh, you'd sort of broken in, not broken in, but found your way into his office in the tri under the Triborough Bridge, is that? Well, I hadn't yet, no. No, no you hadn't no, yet, no, but, no. but you did. You, you found all this great information. Yeah. But there was something that really struck me uh, in your description of, of meeting him. This is like on, uh, when you'd... Uh, you're talking about meeting Moses, and he's he's got this gigantic map up on the wall. Yes. And and he's again he's 78 years old, and he's in his office, and he says, "Now, 78 years old is younger than you are now." I hate to bring that up, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he says when he talked more over, you saw how the dreams and the will to accomplish them were still burning, undimmed by age. And then on the next page, you write, "Driving home that night." I realized that when Robert Moses was looking out the window at the bridge in the park, he hadn't been thinking about them, about the things he had built. He had been thinking about the things he hadn't built. Yes. And when I read that, I thought, Robert Caro. Uh, because you're, you know, you've still got these, this one gigantic project in front of you. I mean, uh, are you still feeling that intensity and that excitement about bringing this, th this thing to a close? Well, you do feel, um, 
you do feel a sense of real excitement. You want to do it because you take this last volume. You talk about Lyndon Johnson. So in this last volume, Lyndon Johnson passes the Civil Rights Bill, the Voting Rights Bill, Head Start, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, I could go on for a long time. You yeah. say, I don't know that we would have these bills now if Lyndon Johnson hadn't had the legislative genius to get them through then. Uh -huh. So on the one hand, you really feel this is thrilling to see what government can do for people. That's what I, I really think has been forgotten mm -hmm. today. What government, what was it like? Now, I'm working on a section now, which you basically could say is what it was like to be old and sick in America before Medicare. Mm -hmm. What was it like then? And as Rose, Franklin Roosevelt, what was it like to be old in America before Social Security? Mm -hmm. You lost your, you know, you, you, were, you lost your job in a factory. You were never going to work again. There was no money coming in. Mm -hmm. It was a different world. So government can do so much for you. And in this last volume, and if I, if I managed to do it, I don't say that I am, you would see through Lyndon, what, the, what Lyndon Johnson does, what government can do for people. At the same time, you have Vietnam, which is a terrible story. And that is also Lyndon Johnson's mm -hmm. story. So you say, this is really a hard volume to do, but you'd really like to be able to do it right because you can show both sides of government, mm -hmm. uh, if you do that. And you've also got the his life after the presidency, well, which in a way could be the whole volume itself, I guess. <laughs> but we won't, we won't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> but you, you, and you talked about, at one point, and maybe you're still thinking about it, going to living in Vietnam for a while or spending some time yes. there. Because just as you did in the Hill Country, you wanted to make sure that you understood the effects of power on powerless people, yes. and certainly there could be no more powerful or, or you know, effect on, on people in Vietnam than, than the war that, that, yes. that was visited upon. Yes. So, uh, also, you're thinking, or maybe you are already writing a memoir. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've written. Yeah. You've written it? I mean, no, I haven't written all of it, but I've uh -huh. written it. Yeah. So you're, you're working on that at the same time? No. I can, well, I can't write two books at the same time. Uh -huh. So when I'm writing the Johnson book, I'm not writing the memoir. Uh -huh. But when I'm doing research, you know, uh, I, can, I can work on the memoir. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I won't ask when we're, we can expect that either. <laughs> uh, we have time for a few questions. I, uh, if you would like to ask a question, I believe there are microphones somewhere. Yes. Power broker, I remember how powerfully I was affected by it 40 years ago, and learning from Steve that there's so much that's not part of it. After in five, 20 years, you have finished all of the LBJ, can we get the rest of the power broker? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's true that uh, I'd like to publish, and my publisher would like me to, to publish, uh, the, we cut, as I said earlier, 350,000 words out of the power broker. That's about three novels. Yeah, yeah. the so, average uh, novel is eight, 80 to 100,000 words. Well, <laughs> so you live in hope that that will be published sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Director's <Right>. cut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Bob, going out and living in the Hill Country, the Hill Country hadn't changed all that much from the time you were writing about to the time that you were there. But Vietnam seems a very different place. Do you really think you can get that same kind of sense of what it was like in the 60s by going to Vietnam now? Yeah, well, two of the things you want to do is what it was like for American boys <clears throat> for, to fight, have to fight in the jungle. You know, There are a lot of wonderful memoirs by uh, soldiers who were fighting in the jungle. And that's a, I, I'd like to try to do that. But another thing, you say, you know, Lyndon Johnson w often picked bombing targets himself. So I want to go to some of these villages. You see, they were bombed by B-52s, which not only fly so high that they're invisible, but they fly so high that you can't hear them. So these villages, 
sometimes didn't know they were being bombed until the bombs actually hit. So you say you want to go and see. You don't, you know, sir, you, it's a very good question that you asked. You don't know what you're going to find until you go to, until you go to a place. And I don't know what I'm going to find uh, when I'm there. Over here? We're just praying you all make it back. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma I, I was I was dining on Saturday night with a friend of mine who's a federal judge in Houston, and I was telling him about being so excited about coming to hear you tonight. I had heard you in New York a couple of years ago being interviewed, and um, he said, "Oh, Robert Caro, he's a guy who's lived his whole life writing about men he didn't like," <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to. Uh, to answer him with your own words. Um. Well, that's not true. You can, you can tell him that. Uh, certainly with Lyndon Johnson, I feel there are two sides to him. I, you know, people say, my feeling with Johnson is awe, A-W-E, because I think my books are about political power. But this was a man who could really use political power for great ends. You know, you say, so in the volume I'm doing now, Martin Luther King is marching in Selma. You know, Johnson decides to submit a Voting Rights Act. And one of his speechwriters, Richard Goodwin, who I talked to about this, told me, He's writing this speech, Johnson's great speech, when he says, we shall overcome. It's not, it's not Negroes who have to overcome. It's us who have to overcome, and we shall overcome. And Goodwin was telling me how he said, asked Johnson, Goodwin may have actually asked him in these words, because he was not a diplomatic guy, do you really mean this, is this, or are you just doing this because it's politically the right thing to do. And Johnson told them about how when he was 21 years old, he had to drop out of school uh, for a year because he was so poor to make money to go on. He taught what they called the Mex in the Mexican school down in Catula. And I wrote, no teacher had ever, I wrote, no teacher had ever cared if these kids learned or not. This teacher cared. And Johnson says to Goodwin, the exact words are in my book, I, but there, he says, you know, I swore then that if I ever had the power to help these children, I was going to do it. Now I have the power, and I mean to use it. Now I think that's a real sincere side of someone that I'm writing about. I don't think it's at all accurate to say uh, that I'm writing about men I don't like. I'm writing about men who use political power in huge and significant ways, and that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Several years ago, you were interviewed by Evan Smith, and we were there, and you said the one person who would not agree to talk to you was Bill Moyers, and I wonder if he ever did. No. <laughs> It's a succinct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any, any gloss on that? Any reason that he doesn't no. want to talk to you that you know of? No, okay. he hasn't said so. Okay. Uh, but I'll take this opportunity to say, because I know George Christian's daughter is here tonight, and I, I don't know, that he is, I think, the, about the only one left. The, the Johnson people now, of course, are all dead. I used to come to Austin. And I had <laughs> Whoever that was, I apologize. <laughs> but I used to have so many friends down here, people that I made friends with over the years, John Connolly, Walter Jenkins, you know, Ed Clark. Now when I come to Austin, almost all of those, almost all of those people <laughs> are now deceased. So you, you feel, first place, you feel this weird thing that you're left. And I felt with people like John Connolly 
and Ed Clark, who for years, that's a name not so known anymore, but for about 40 years he was known as the secret boss of Texas. I felt they were taking all this time with me, among other reasons, so that I could try, so that I would describe what Texas politics used to be like. You know, it's a vanished world. So when I have that in mind all the time when I'm writing now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've, you're, you're reviving a vanished world, and uh, yeah. we're all grateful for it. And we, yeah, I, I think we're out of time, but we really appreciate you coming. And this book is, is wonderful. I mean, if you haven't read Working, uh, it, it belongs on your shelf with a place of honor next to Robert Caro's other magisterial books. So thank you, thank you, Bob. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.